Thank you, Lacey. Um, I want to give a little bit of background on um, the program that this is a part of. Um, today's webinar is part of the California Association of Museums CAM Fellows Program, which has been in existence for about 10 years. Uh, this program allows alumni of the Getty Morrow Undergraduate Internship Program to attend the CAM Conference and develop case studies based on sessions that inspired them. These case studies offer expanded understanding of topics that were discussed at the conference and help supply lessons learned in other institutions. I'd like to thank the Getty Foundation for their generous funding to continue the CAM Fellows Program. Now I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Our first CAM Fellows presenter today is Emily Butts. Emily is a second year master's student in art history at the University of Texas at Austin studying contemporary U.S. Latinx and Latin American art. Her thesis project explores the work of Adriana Corral and the use of art objects as a way to understand historical occurrences, specifically surrounding human rights abuses along the U.S.-Mexico border. Prior to returning to graduate school, she served as the curatorial assistant at LACMA for the exhibition Home, So Different, So Appealing. In 2018, she was granted the Emerging Curator Award from the Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. So thank you for joining us today, Emily. The floor is yours. Emily, you're muted right now. I'm going to just, if you could, Okay. There you go. Is it working? And I'm going to okay. mute myself and give you back control. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Celeste, again, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, Lacey, for all of your help um, making this all possible. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Getty as well as um, Catherine Toy, who um, was my collaborator for this project and who presented um, on a panel called SOS for Ethnic Specific Museums, The Art of Creating Cultural um, and Political Capital, um, which was at CAM um, in February. Um, so this ended up being the um, panel that I focused on um, for some of the reasons that I outlined in my article um, and that I'll go over today as well. Um, I probably won't go as much into the in depth into the history um, as the article did or as uh, Catherine did on the panel, but um, I guess I'm aiming to sort of understand um, the overarching um, framework for that this panel placed onto this um, historic immigration station. Um, so the description for the panel um, was ethnic specific museums face unspoken challenges that stem from societal disadvantages and the historical lack of resources of cultural ethnic groups. Three museum professionals will shine a light on ethnic museums' true assets and how they leverage their cultural and political capital as, them, as they navigated their institution's early years. So the three institutions that were being presented were all San Francisco based, it was the Mexican Museum, the Museum of African Diaspora, and then Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation which is um, what I ended up focusing on for this. Um, the learning objectives for the conference panel were to identify and recognize valued cultural and political asset, assets of ethnic specific museums, how to leverage and employ these assets with key stakeholders, including local government officials, developers, and planners to help sustain your institution. Um, which I interpreted leaving that panel as how to convince people that this matters, why is this museum important, uh, or why um, should we be preserving these ethnic histories. Um, and I think that my case study that I moved forward with and the research that I ended up doing um, was trying to understand how a space such as the Angel Island Immigration Station that processed uh, immigrants from over 80 countries um, could be considered an ethnic specific um, museum. Um, like while it was the West Coast counterpart to Ellis Island and therefore um, was sort of the gatekeeper on the Pacific, becoming more of a um, defining the Asian American experience, um, I, I think I'm still, the a case study was to sort of grapple with um, the framing of this 
immigration station as ethnic specific. Um, and this is something that I think about a lot um, in my own studies or my own curatorial practice. Um, I study contemporary Latinx art um, at the University of Texas right now. Um, and it's something that comes up um, with artists that I work with whose work might be reduced to identity politics or the politics of identity and um, having to prove why these matter, why these histories or why this art or why uh, X amount of whatever it is, uh, why it matters to people who might not come from these backgrounds. And it's something that I face working within an institution as well um, to defend the artworks or these histories um, to people who might not have the same lived experience as well. Um, so this presentation in my article is sort of exploring um, the role of historic preservation in this instance in legitimizing a space. Um, so I worked with Catherine Toy, who is a board member at the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy and the director of the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. Um, in this specific space, uh, the island that's off the coast of San Francisco um, housed, I'm not gonna go into the whole history of it, like pre-conquest to Spanish conquest, but more starting in the late 19th century um, and early 20th. And uh, the space housed military forts, a US public health service quarantine station, and a US Bureau of Immigration Inspection and a detention facility. Um, most of the spaces have been demolished, but um, Catherine and her team work to restore the spaces and, and preserve them um, and also to obtain national historic landmark status. Um, okay. I would like to go to the next slide. There we go. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm not going to read through all of the history of the island um, but beginning in 1882 is, I guess, we'll, we'll, where I'll start, um, which is when the U.S. signed into the Chinese Exclusion Act into federal law, um, which suspended Chinese immigration until after World War II. Um, and the Angel Island Immigration Station was utilized specifically to enforce this law um, as the Western port um, for Chinese immigrants from the Pacific. So from 1910 to 1940, approximately 1 million immigrants from 80 countries or processed on the island. Um, and these countries were you know, ranged from China to Mexico, India, Philippines, Japan, to name a few, um, which is what I'm sort of starting to question is this being an ethnic specific story or an American story, or even one that's you know a more transnational one as well. Um, so here's a slide of immigrants waiting to be inspected. They're, um, often asked to undress and um, be inspected that way, which um, was often, you know, a humiliating one um, in addition to one that's, you know, quite dehumanizing. Um, they were asked, you know, to bathe um, and to change and go through all of their stuff. Um, so I, as I dug a little bit deeper into this story, um, I came across this quarantine station that was placed on the island as well. Um, and this was um, used, what I read, beginning in 1891, um, because a ship had arrived that had smallpox on board. Um, and the ship, this was the first, uh, these first passengers who were asked to be quarantined on the island. Um, so they were stripped for inspection, like we saw on the previous slide, um, and bathed in carbolic soap. Um, they were given overalls to wear, um, and their baggage and clothes were sent to be disinfected. Um, so you can see them coming in on the island and as well as them waiting to be inspected and then these tunnels, these disinfecting tubes that were used to disinfect their belongings. Um, so then they were often detained on the island as well. Um, and these processing times were, you know, took many days. They weren't, they were, on the island for quite some time um, waiting to be processed. Um, so they were sent to barracks um, that were fumigated with sulfur dioxide and flushed with salt water every day for 14 days. Um, and this was sort of something that stuck with me um, that, that's connecting to some research that I did this past summer in terms of these medical gatekeeping practices um, at these points of entry in the United States and the use of public health discourse as a way to almost defend 
xenophobia or anti-immigrant sensibility within the United States. Um, okay. Um, I wanted to include, oh goodness, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I wanted to include images of the poetry because from what I understand, it, these are um, poetry that was carved into the walls from the de de detainees, the immigrants that were detained on the island, um, sort of outlining their sorrow and the humiliation and the sadness um, of being detained um, from trying to, you know, start their new lives. Um, and so these were sort of, from what I understand, the basis of uh, the conservation efforts um, from Catherine and her team um, to sort of look at these poems and, um, you know, keep them from being erased from these from our history. And there's a large sense of um, shame and secrecy, it seems, of what had happened and um, that often wasn't discussed, but preserving the notion of what preserving these does to um, help people maybe emerge from erasure or to keep them from being erased or keep these histories from being erased. Um, and another thing that stuck out to me that Catherine said was the conservation effort um, was a form of a public apology, or she didn't say that verbatim, but it's, it was implied, um, but that the preservation and the conservation of these poems were as close as they were getting going to get to an apology um, for detention, which um, really stuck with me and resonated with me. Um, and understanding how a museum um, creates the cultural capital through preservation techniques and, and through affect as well, through poetry. Um, so I want to discuss a little bit how I came to this um this history and, and what I'm trying to connect um, this to. Um, so this is an image of the artist who I wrote about for my master's thesis, which I just wrapped up um, the last few weeks. Her name is Abriana Corral and she's from El Paso, Texas, based in San Antonio and Houston. Um, and she installed this flag at a former processing center um, for the Bracero program, which is a foreign worker program that was put into place during World War II, but was um, effective for 22 years um, in the United States. And this is one of five um, processing sites for the Bracero, and this was the last one standing. Um, so it's just outside of El Paso um, in Socorro, Texas. And this farm um, processed about 80,000 Mexican guest workers a year. Um, so for those who don't know, the Bracero program was a foreign worker program that was in effect from 1942 to 1964, and there were an estimated 4.6 million short-term labor contracts issued to Mexican workers. Um, and some of them would have to come through multiple times, so they would be sent off to um, the place where they were working, and then they would be sent home and then come back through the center. And when they got here, it was a similar experience. They would be stripped and um, bathed and in this instance, and in this time period in the 40s and 50s, they were deloused with um, DDT, um, which for anyone who's read or heard of Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, um, that was that pesticide was used on crops as well as on these um, human bodies coming in um, for disinfecting purposes. Um, so I guess I bring this up because Coral worked with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, um, specifically with Sela Casper, who works there, to get this space to be um, to be awarded national uh, landmark status, um, and and what that does to sort of solidify a history or to um, preserve it um, from erasure, as well. Um, and so I included these images here as well, if only to sort of compare the two experiences of Mexican um, American workers or Asian American workers or Asian American immigrants coming into this country and how the treatment was so similar on both sides. Um, so the top left and the bottom right are images of Braceros coming in to the United States and the bottom they're being lost with DDT. Um, so these were our later time period. Um, and I'm also bringing these into this because this was some of the work that I did um, with Avellana this past summer at the National Archives in DC. 
Um, and we found this um, memo on the bottom left um, that was the mayor of El Paso at the time, Tom Lee, and he wrote it to the Surgeon General, um, Rupert Blue, was saying hundreds of uh, dirty laws be destitute Mexicans arriving at El Paso daily will undoubtedly bring in spread typhus unless the quarantine is based. Um, so I, I'm bringing this back in because I'm really interested in how um, public health in this discourse was used as an avenue, you know, to create a sort of hysteria along the border. And there weren't many cases of typhus in, at the end of the day that were brought into the United States, but um, this, this sort of fear that was produced um, in, in the media and in newspaper outlets, um, as well as by um, word of mouth and, and how um, this sort of language becomes um, racialized and becomes part of um, our rhetoric today is something that I'm interested in. Um, and so I'm trying to tie this history of Angel Island and the immigration station there to this history along the US-Mexico border because the US-Mexico border, it said that um, the Border Patrol was established on the, in Texas to um, stop Chinese immigrants from coming in. Um, the Border Patrol wasn't established until 1924. Um, it was an informal sort of militia-based um, informal, uh, you know, men on horseback they're called mountain agents who, who patrolled the border. Um, but I'm, I did, we were looking at um, the Santa Fe International Bridge specifically um, because we, as we dug deeper into the archives, we learned that there was a quarantine facility placed there as well. Um, so this building that we're looking at here is below the building in the previous um, slide. And so we were going through these spaces and, and looking and finding blueprints um, that show the disinfecting room, the gas room, um, as well as uh, Sanborn fire insurance maps that outline this history. Um, so this would have traditionally been colored. This is a black and white rendition, but it would show um, the materials that the building was made out of for fire insurance purposes. So this was the US Immigration and Naturalization Service Office um, that you can see the bath headquarters sort of placed within there. Um, and so I'm bringing this in up because um, to sort of understand how this might not be necessarily an ethnic specific story or it might be an American story, um, but it also might be a transnational one as well. Um, so this is a book from a German scientist, Gerard Peters. Um, I'm not gonna attempt to read the title. It's from 1937. And I got um, a few of the, a, a portion of this book translated by a German um, student at UT. Um, and it actually, this page stuck out to me. It's the page 51 of the book because it has this um, tunnel. Um, it, it translates to gassing tunnel in El Paso. That's what the figure says. And that's not a building that I recognize or that I've seen or I'm, something that I'm trying to, you know, track down or, you know, think about how this history um, that began as a quarantine, a typhus quarantine on the U.S.-Mexico border circa 1915 and 1917, how um, this sort of conversation or discourse around eugenics as a way to keep a you know, country peer um, to keep, to exclude some people and to include others. Um, how that um, might not only belong on a panel on a museum conference that is ethnic specific, but one um, that goes beyond um, to like a transnational lens as well. Um, and how do we discuss that in our field? Um, so I'm gonna leave it there. Um, I'm happy to discuss any of the work I did for my thesis with Abriana, as well as um, some of the research I did for Angel Island, um, or uh, the research I did in the National Archives, sort of, it's more surrounding the built environment and architecture, um, and how that's used as ways to sort of oppress or to keep people out um, as well. So I hope. <laughs>
that you all enjoyed that. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, look forward to your comments. Okay, I see that Catherine Toy raised her hand. Do I accept that or? So I can unmute myself, does that work? Yes, that works. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Emily, thank you so much for giving this presentation. I really enjoyed learning how you connected it to the story of the immigration station at Angel Island. And I just in, in the hour prior to this, I was on a call with California State Parks at Angel Island and our exhibit designers because we're moving into the next phase of designing the exhibits for the hospital at the immigration station, which is looking at medical gatekeeping. So your um, research was um, new to me and I'm really glad to know about it now. So hope we will be in touch as the exhibit design firm is going along further to um, talk about what are the connections more broadly, not just at the site in particular, but of what it means on, on a more national scale. So thank you very much. And thank you for your work as well. Um, without it, I couldn't have uh, made these connections. So thank you. Great, are there any other questions? for Emily. Well, I'm sure Emily, if you want to put your um, your email address in the chat box, then if anybody wants to follow up with you via email about this, we can go ahead and that'd be a great way to reach out to you. Sounds good. Thank you. So great. Much. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much for the interesting case study and your your thought provoking um, ideas. So thank you. Thank you. Our um, second presenter today is Angela Medrano. Um, Angela is a first generation Mexican Filipina American dedicated to furthering equity through the arts. She currently works as a full time communications assistant at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, LACMA, and volunteers as treasurer on the board of the Museum Educators of Southern California. Previously, she worked as pro program assistant at Turnaround Arts California a nonprofit organization that brings arts-based educational strategies to schools to narrow the opportunity gap, increase student engagement, and improve campus culture and climate. She also has held other positions at LACMA, the Dallas Museum of Art, and the Dickinson College Trout Gallery. So, Angela, please join us. All right, it looks like I'm a go. Um, so again, thank you, Emily, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I learned so much from it, and I'm excited to explore it a bit more. Um, so before I start my presentation, I want to go ahead and again thank um, the California Association of Museums for granting me my fellowship, as well as to Celeste and Lacey um, for helping me through this presentation process. Um, I want to thank the Getty Foundation for once granting me the Getty Morrow undergraduate internship um, actually in 2016 at LACMA in their education department, um, as well as to Nancy Lee for collaborating with me. Um, so I'll go ahead and share a bit about Nancy Lee, who's my collaborator. Um, she is Senior Manager of Public Relations at the Hammer Museum at UCLA. She grew up in Los Angeles as a second generation Korean American. At UC Berkeley, she majored in art history and business, then interned at the Peggy Guggenheim Collection in Venice, Italy. She received a master's in museum studies from Johns Hopkins University, then returned to Los Angeles and worked in communications at the Museum of Contemporary Art um, before joining my hammer. So thank you, Nancy, for collaborating with me. Um, so yes, I've been working as a 
a communications assistant at LACMA, located in Mid-City in Los Angeles, kind of um, along the Miracle Mile for just six months now, so I'm fairly new. Um, so far, um, I do things like copy edit general announcements, and I help compose press kits for exhibition openings. Um, I manage press clips, and I'm currently learning the systems in place to help manage um, the communications and marketing finances. Um, so yes, prior to my work here at LACMA, I worked as an arts at an arts nonprofit, Culture and Arts California, as a program assistant, where I did much of the same things, um, but I also kind of managed our social media content. Um, and throughout my kind of art nonprofit um, museum educator communications journey, I've tried my best to meditate in, you know, how does my institution, how does my department, and how do I um, contribute actively to the community that I'm affecting, um, as well as to the museum field, you know, or otherwise support those trying. Um, as a first generation, uh, Mexican Filipino American um, raised um, by a very from a working class background. I grew up with a limited access to art and non Western histories, and I first gained access to my own history through our objects in college at Dickinson College. Um, and through that experience, I ex I witnessed how essential it is for audience to feel represented in the arts. Um, and this feeling of validation in the art world, you know, seeing my own family's history embodied in art and thus um, acknowledged, um, it became my greatest motivation in furthering equitable museum experiences as a museum educator, as an arts administrator, and now as a communications assistant. Um, so when I think um, equity, um, what I really think about is kind of representation. So how many bodies are not only present in the museum staff that represent, you know, a variety of backgrounds and upbringings, um, but also kind of how much voice do they have? And in turn, how much power do they have? Um, so, I want to go ahead and meditate on this quote with all of you. Um, so it says, while 73% of the population of Los Angeles County identifies as people of color, the arts workforce is 60% white. Um, so these are the things that were kind of simmering in my mind, both my personal experience as well as this um, very data-based understanding of the arts sector the museum sector in California. Um, so I was thinking about these things as I entered CAMS conference um, called Changing the Narrative in February. Um, and my main question was, how can I, an emerging museum professional, encourage or otherwise sustain equity in the museum and the communications field? Um, and I was able to meditate on this question through a panel called inspirational marketing, um, which centered on successful communications and marketing initiatives. Um, so within the panel discussion, um, Nancy Lee shared her insights into the communication strategy behind the exhibition Made in LA 2018. Um, so I'm very grateful that Nancy is here with us today um, to give her insight into the Hammer Museum at UCLA and its acclaimed biennial made in LA. Hi, Angela, could we go back just one? Sure. Um, just so we can look at the quote by Ann Philbin, the director of the Hammer Museum, that encapsulates a lot of how the Hammer sees itself and what we're trying to do. So um, we are a free admission art museum that's part of UCLA. We're located in, in Westwood, Los Angeles, and we have an annual attendance of about 250,000 visitors a year, and 70% of those visitors are locals. 
So the backbone of our collection is this old masters painting collection with Rembrandts, Renoirs, Monets. And we also host about 300 public programs throughout the year and serve as a community gathering space. And we throw really great concerts and parties in the museum courtyard. So we're trying to be more than an art museum for sure. Um, and our main focus is contemporary art. Okay, next slide, please. So Made in LA is our signature biennial exhibition series. And it started in 2012. And we focus on showing artists from the LA region with a focus on emerging and under-recognized artists. So we've had four iterations of Made in LA so far. And my presentation at CAM was about 2018, um, which was co-curated by Anne Elgood and Aaron Christabel. And the artist list was um, this incredible mix of queer, female, people of color, young and old artists, incredibly diverse. And one of the things I talked about in my presentation is that none of the exhibition materials, including the press release, really made a big deal out of that fact because we all saw it as kind of a matter of fact. LA is a super diverse city, so Made in LA should have an equally diverse artist list. Um, so I think that's enough context for me, Angela. Great. <clears throat> awesome. So yes, during um, her, her panel um, at CAM, Nancy shared that many of the artists did identify or self-identify as queer um, and or POC, person of color, um, and this language was not included in press releases. And when she said that, I, um, I just felt that it, it made so much sense to me. Um, you know, as a newcomer to this world, um, to this field of communications, I'm really eager to learn the ins and outs of what makes, you know, an excellent PR professional. Um, I'm thinking someone that is, you know, creative, um, efficient, knowledgeable about the collection, um, earnest, and as far as I'm concerned, eager to learn how the comms and PR field can better work towards um, practices of equity. Um, and this slide is an intentionally blank, <laughs> but um, a bit about the world of communications um, within the museum sector. Um, our goal is to share the goings on at a museum to journalists um, so that they can in turn report more widely to their readership. Um, so ideally, that they can work to produce things like print, um, television, radio pieces, and more. Um, so that people like you um, can be aware of and excited about attending the programs and visiting the exhibitions um, at that museum. So um, this medium might also encourage donors um, and collaborators to begin or otherwise continue supporting the museum and sustaining its mission statement. Um, and the reason why I'm drawn to the world of communications is because of power. Um, you know, there's power in the words that you and I choose, and certainly there is power in the words that um, the media chooses. Um, and this is positive because words allow us to share information um, and joy, um, but they can also be negative because they can manipulate. Um, they can sting. So um, historically, um, and even in today's political climate, not all persons um, are represented in the same way in the media. Um, Lisa Nakamura, a professor of screen arts and cultures um, and American cultures at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, writes that people of color, women, sexual minorities, and other subaltern individuals possess less power within the media system, which has often represented them in stereotyped, limited ways. In other words, mass media do not hail all bodies equally. Um, and I'm sure you all know, um, our words, they carry sociopolitical weight and power, um, shared by those who use and read them. Um, and because of this, crafting text, um, so press releases, 
for the press to share and expand upon must be intentional in both tone and word choice. And I feel that um, when Nancy shared um, that specific keywords, PUC and queer, were not included in her press releases, that definitely is an exemplifier of it. Um, and when she shared that, that was, it was honestly a moment where I felt like, why is this the first time that I've heard this? Um, because it just makes so much sense to me. Um, by using language that wasn't othering or otherwise limiting, the Hammers PR team allowed for the presence of historically marginalized voices and their artworks to be you know, welcomed into the norm, to be established as a kind of new status quo. Um, and this is amplified when we think of the artist involved in the hammers made in LA uh, biennials. Um, so I have this quote from Artnet that really um, highlights this. Um, it shares that kind of relative to the other shows of its kind, the Hammers Biennial, which was founded in 2012, has constantly been diverse. Um, 12 or less than half of the 25 artists in 2016 made in LA were male, and many of them identified as neither straight or white. Um, this year, and by that it means 2018, um, 23 out of 33 artists are female, or gender non-conforming, and 19 are of color. Um, these demographics are not the show's defining feature, but taking difference as a given, rather than an exception, uh, feels refreshing in a literal way, um, as if someone reset the status quo's um, homepage. So Angela asked me to talk about how a typical Made in LA press rollout goes and then highlight some of the key differences in 2018 that led to it being such a, a record successful PR uh, biennial for us. So this first slide you see um, typically how Made in LA, uh, LA announcements go. So a year out, uh, so every other summer Made in LA happens at the Hammer and a year out we will announce the two curators who will be putting together the next biennial. And then four months before the show opens, we'll reveal the final list of artists. And then the week before uh, the show opens to the public, we'll invite the press in for a special tour with the curators and a preview. And then right before the show closes, there's a component of Made in LA that comprises these three awards that the artists can get. And we'll announce the awards two weeks before close because one of them is a public vote award. So we want to um, make sure that the public has as long a window as possible to vote on site. Um, next slide, please. So in 2018, we hit the expected uh, press moments, but also there were a couple of um, additional um, news announcements that were able to be tied back to Made in LA 2018. So in February 2017, a year out, um, we announced that Anne and Erin were the curators uh, for Made in LA 2018. And at the time, Erin was an independent curator. And so in June 2017, when we hired her to be um, on the Hammer curatorial team, that was a moment to remind people that Made in LA 2018 was the next project that Erin was gonna work on. She was a really exciting young uh, independent curator in LA, so it made quite a splash in the um, art news world. And then in February 2018, we announced the artist list on schedule. And then that same month, the Hammer also uh, announced this big capital campaign and building project that we are lining up for um, now through 2020. So in that momentum, we were able to plug Made in LA as the next show that was happening at the Hammer and that um, reinforced a lot of the excitement um, ahead of the show. And then in June 2018, we had the press preview. And in August of that year, we did the Moan Awards announcement. Um, next slide, please. So the Moan Awards announcement um, is also a chance for me to talk about some of the art stars that came out of our Made in LA uh, 2018. And one of these was Lauren Halsey, who uh, won the Moan Award that year, but was also having a really big moment in the art world. She had 
this solo show at MOCA across town. And she continues to have a really um, successful and productive career and is um, present in uh, Venice Biennial this summer and has a project at the Louis Vuitton Foundation in France. So every time Lauren does something amazing, Made in LA 2018 gets name checked. So it's been such a, a great uh, yeah, callback to something that we could be a part of, like Lauren Halsey's career. And that's the same goes for a couple of the artists um, who kind of fell into this um, just lucky timing of uh, Made in LA 2018 happening at uh, an important moment in their careers. So Lucita Hurtado is an artist who also has really taken off and she was even named in Time 100 this year and has this big show at the Serpentine in London and Made in LA 2018 was the first museum show she ever had and that was when she was 97. So she turns 100 next year and is having like this exciting moment in her career and it's taking over the world. And it's really great that we get to be a part of her narrative. And we, you know, of course, have these relationships with these artists um, who are in Made in LA forever. So we get to build this really nice community of artists around the museum. Perfect, thank you. Um, great. So Again, intentional and blank slide. Um, but Nancy's presentation on Made in LA 2018 um, at CAMS conference, um, you know, sharing the Hammer Museum's press strategy um, and team mindset has really provided me a model um, upon which I can continue to meditate on. Um, I want to, you know, kind of clarify that as a communications assistant. I think it's really easy for me to convince myself that I really don't have much kind of power institutionally, um, you know, kind of thinking in creating waves of equity change um, in the museum field. But I do have some um, decision making in my own right. You know, I can think twice about the language I use in museum wide emails. I can opt to have at least one ADA approved method of transportation in um, our press release events. Um, I can include gender pronouns in my email signature and you know the list goes on and I hope to con continue meditating um, on this topic as my career moves forward. Um, and I encourage all museum professionals, you know, no matter their department or their um, career level to ask themselves the exact same question. Um, how can I encourage or otherwise sustain equity in the museum field? Um, so I wanna go ahead and thank Nancy Lee again for collaborating with me. Um, I wanna thank the California Association of Museums, as well as the Getty Foundation, as well as those of you who are watching right now. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Angela, and thank you, Nancy, as well. Um, uh, Angela, could you advance the slide to the last um, one, the last one for me, the last slide? That'd be great, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you for participating in the program today and those of you who are watching the recording thank you very much for um, for listening in and learning about these great two great projects by our CAM fellows um, I would like to um, mention that the California Association of Museums is um, having our conference in downtown Los Angeles in early March of 2020 and the call for proposals is um, happening right now and the deadline is June 7th. So if those of you who are watching have a great idea for a session or a workshop or even just a roundtable discussion, um, we want to hear from you um, that you want to raise your hand and participate in the conference in this way. So again, that deadline for our proposals is June 7th and we look forward to a great conference with the theme 2020 vision. So thank you for your time today and have a great afternoon. Goodbye.